Hey guys, welcome back to Seller Sessions and Awesomers.com. Today's a co-brand with my friend Steve Simonson. We have with us today Kevin King. We also have Kian Gulzari and of course Steve Simonson. How are you doing, gentlemen? Oh, very very well. good, Danny. Excellent. Uh, it's another sunny day in paradise for us all, I think. Steve, you're in the safest place on the planet, which is not on the planet because you're in the in the space now, aren't you? Uh -huh. You yeah, me home? and Branson, we have our own little private capsule. We have to float around in space while you guys deal with viruses and stuff. So don't worry. I'm okay. Excellent. Is Elon up there as well? Elon's well, Elon's uh, he's in an adjacent. Well. He's got his own capsule. But, yeah, we sometimes we oh, connect yeah. for uh, play a little cards. Excellent. Nice. And, and, Kevin, I can see some sunlight where you are as well, mate. Uh, yeah, there's a little bit of coming through, coming through here in Austin. Yeah. And uh, also in Scotland, mate, where they normally yeah, hide the sunshine. Yeah, there's no sunshine here. It's just grey skies as well. I'm looking at. Uh, yeah. Excellent. So right. Good. I'm going to just share these out to some of the groups. Um, right. So let's kick things off today. We're talking about diversifying off of Amazon. Uh, I want you guys to pitch in. You've got diversified businesses. We can talk Shopify. We can talk investments and stuff like that. Uh, Kian also wanted to talk a bit more about um, an extension of the conversation about uh Canton Fair going online and, and what that impacts on. So maybe we start with that and then we can maneuver into other areas for diversified income. Is that right? Good sure, idea. yeah. Sounds cool. good. Off you go. Yeah. So, you know, as we were just sort of chatting a little bit off air, you know, the Canton Fair made the announcement quite recently that it's going to go online. And I think it's going to be June. Uh, I don't know if a, a date has been set yet. But what we were just saying is that, like, the two things that I love most about the Canton Fair is meeting the people that you're doing business with and building those relationships and really sort of understanding who are the real ones and who are the fake ones and then also touching and feeling the products that you want to develop and seeing what they've really got and it's it speeds up the process so much just by sort of being able to make a decision of who you want to make uh, do business with and what products you want to then go out and produce whereas like it takes a while to build those relationships like over email and then receive your samples find out that they're no good find someone else so it's going to be a lot more time consuming and a lot more costly to do it outside of the canton fair so those were just my two cents but i guess we can chat about it in more detail as well kevin your take yeah my take it's similar to keon's and that's the advantage is those relationships actually touch going being able to walk through those halls and actually hold things and see things and just it shortens that window of weeding out the the good from the, the crud and and then also with it being online i just think that's especially for our market which is the amazon seller primarily uh it's not a good thing uh at all uh because now you're going to have it's going to be just like an alibaba everybody's going to see the same stuff everybody's going to be able to see the same stuff same suppliers it's going to be i mean one of the things i love about the canton fair I, I think i mentioned this before is you know i'm one of what maybe a thousand amazon sellers that go to it or something like that yeah. and i'm finding suppliers that aren't online that are not on alibaba like you know they're like nope this is the this is our booth this is what we don't have a brochure we don't have a website we don't have nothing uh and that you're gonna lose all that so i'm actually i think i think canton has to do it because mm -hmm. You know, their, their vendors uh, are, are screaming for it and they don't really care. Uh, but from our perspective as an Amazon seller, I don't think it's a good thing. Yep. Sounds good. Good. Um, Steve, your take. Uh, well, in general, I agree that it, it's not ideal for the, the average, well, for the, the Amazon seller who wants to be awesome, right? Uh, mm -hmm. they, if they really want to differentiate, if they really want to uh, understand and accelerate that to Kean's point, a Canton Fair is useful. I personally, I would, I won't miss huffing it around that place. Uh, I, there's plenty of ways to get things done. Uh, some of our best ideas that we've uh, come up with in the last 90 days, we're not from Canton, we're not from Iwu, they're not from anywhere. Uh, so yeah. the job can still get done. Uh, yeah. I, I do think the it's a face-saving move, if I can say so. Uh, you know, the I, I said back in January or maybe early February, it's going to be canceled. And I got a lot of flack, by the way. Everybody's like, oh, no, it's not officially canceled. They're still counting it down on their website. I'm like, okay, yeah, you're right. I said cancel with a question mark in fairness. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I'd like to feel a little vindication because an online show is a face-saving maneuver. It's not a productive show. It's certainly not the power that uh, is walking around Canton, like Ken said. We can see things. We can talk to people. We know uh, viscerally what's real and what's not. So big, big difference. Can I make, uh, well, uh, it's probably an outlandish statement, but do you think that Canton Fair is overrated? 
Like I've been a few times, right? And I found is that you get hauls of the same stuff over and over again. I'm sure you can, you know, you find nuances there, but on the whole, it's just such a big place. And there's a lot of repetition there that, um, yeah, I just I get a feeling. I, th I think if you're newer to the sourcing or you're mm. just wanting a one-stop shop or you, you run some store in the Middle East, you know, a little market, mm. it, it's, it's okay. But I think there's a lot better ways to source once you really get into this and once you become serious, mm. um, as Steve was uh, to Steve's point, you know, there's, there's, there's much better methods. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's what I mean. It's a good place to start, get experience, build up knowledge base, negotiation and stuff. And then obviously I know people like Ewu is like a flea market, unless you know what you're doing, you can spot down there. If you've got translators or you've got uh, a team of people that can help you to navigate those markets as well. I suppose it's a good entry point, isn't it? On a broader scale, or if you'd sell in like uh, me too products or most common products, especially in home and kitchen and stuff, it's a good resource to negotiate when you've got products that are very similar to each other. So it gives you an ease of negotiation. One of the things I like about, I mean, I guess from Canton, the thing I like most is not so much do I find a product there that I'm going to sell. Mm. It's an idea generator. It's a brainstorming session. Yes. You know, I'm, I'm walking yeah. through there going, oh, that's a cool, I never thought about that category yeah. of stuff. Or, oh, yeah. wow, that guy's selling that. I just saw 20,000 other people saw the same thing he's selling. What mm. if I did this, this, and this, and this? Uh, yeah. So that's the biggest benefit. For me. My, 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 for me, my favorite part of ever going to the Canton Fair is that it cuts through everything because there's when you're like i kind of march and walk along and you can literally if you're 10 feet away you can generally see quality and the fact is you can walk up and pick something up there and then you've just shaved off a load of time on say alibaba getting images the images are not that great and then from there you obviously getting samples sent to you and you find all this stuff out later but within 15 seconds of picking that product up you get a good feel for things and that's one of the key advantages as well yeah, I, I feel also it, de it depends on a number of products that you're actually sourcing, because if you're just one brand with a couple of products then going to the factory is more than enough. But yeah. uh, like a few years ago, like I was doing like hundreds of products like for our camping and outdoor brand. And it was like it was a savior for me because I could see the majority of my suppliers all under one roof and I could have like 50, 60 different meetings a day and get so much work done in those five days. I mean, yeah. I'd go on the first bus in the morning, come back at the last bus at night and then have the suppliers in for meetings in the hotel and even in those five or six days of phase three still not get all my work done so yeah. that that was amazing versus having to go to visit all those factories individually so yeah. it depends on the number of products you're doing if you are sourcing quite a lot then it is still an amazing fair and to kev's yeah. point as well it's great to get new ideas as well because uh depending on your relationships with the suppliers they like to show you new products but they don't have that front end on display but they'll have it like in the back but if you build yeah. enough rapport with them if you have good enough and enough relationship with them you'll see a lot of new products there as well uh, which we'll miss but definitely going to the factories where you do the best work in my opinion and mm -hmm. i sort of uh, view sourcing from china like beginner intermediate and advanced like your yeah. beginner is your alibaba your intermediate is a canton fair and your yeah, advanced cool. is in the factory yes. uh, so but there's still a lot of volume that goes through that intermediate level at the canton fair so now mm -hmm. you know it's going to make things a little bit more challenging i'm gonna have to spend a lot more time in china uh, in the factories directly now yeah Makes total sense. Cool. Are well, we kind of covered here? Should we start to think about some of the other off Amazon stuff that we were going to talk about? Steve, you uh, obviously sell on Amazon, but you do a hell of a lot off Amazon as well. What kind of things can uh, can people look to do in the current climate from your opinion? Well, uh, first of all, the, the summary for me, if I take Kian and uh, hmm. Kevin and your comments in for those fairs, it's not the size of the event. It's how you use it, everybody. And uh, th that really goes uh, – I, I can make Canton really work well. Do you know what? I've never seen the Canton, Canton well. Fair, this huge Canton Fair uses oh, a you guys laughing? I'm making a legitimate point here. Yeah. No, you're right. Okay. You're right. Okay. So the, just you guys can write that something? down. Make yeah. some t-shirts. Um, so Jesus Christ. Yeah. Okay. The, the, on, uh, my objective here is to talk about how we diversify now. Yes. Uh, and, you know, there's a few things. To, to me, I, have, I think you have to start with the context of where you are. Yeah. So there's some sellers right now, their context is I, I sell luggage. Nobody's buying luggage. It's a catastrophic situation. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I don't have any diversification luggage solutions for you. The context matters because that's, that's a tough problem. We have to look into alternative categories. We have to look into triage. Um, whereas if you have another category, uh, let's say supplements or something that is, is blowing up, 
your your problem may be how do I cope with cash flow or how do I you know uh, ramp this thing up? How do I so th those are two ends of the spectrum. So context matters, mm -hmm. and I would just say you, knowing your brand's why is important. Uh, for us, we start with a multi-channel from the beginning. I, I think maybe Kian does the same, and say what where can we sell this? Who are the the typical buyers? And we want to find buyers at every level, not just Amazon kind of consumer buyers, mm. but you know, where else do people shop? Do they shop in big boxes like uh, warehouse stores? Do they shop in grocery stores? Do they shop in uh, you know uh, apparel type store, uh, stores or what it have you, department stores? So knowing that why is helpful. Yeah. But all of that said, it's still tough to to transition into kind of that big box. So there's a lot of other ways to do it. We'll talk about that. But knowing your the context and then the why to me is a beginning point. Yeah, makes total sense. Cool. So let's talk about um let's split it up into a few areas because we've got Amazon sellers are doing very well in the current climate. They've got some cash they're sitting on. Do they go back into buying more inventory, which they will anyway? But what do they do with that additional cash for rainy day, for recession proof? How do they diversify? Now, Kevin, I know you've got probably about nine businesses here, eight or nine businesses. You're a machine. Uh, I, have a few, I have a few, yeah. Yeah, I've got three. And I've got diversification in the three different type of revenue models, which has served me well in the current climate, yeah? What what should people do out there? Because I see it quite com common is that there's the the rush to seven figures and some people got there based on leveraging their finances to get there and maybe get caught out and don't have a, a lot of cash on hand. I mean, if you're new, uh, I mean, to Steve's point, it's all context. Yeah. I mean, he's in the, uh, it makes total sense for him when he. Yeah. Oh, we're losing, we're losing you, Kevin. He's established a team, he's got the money. Kevin's turned into a robot, everybody. With, we're losing Kevin. <laughs> oh, uh oh. Am I back? Here he comes. There we go. He's back. There. there we go. Oh, all right. I don't know. To Steve's point, it's, it's all about uh, context. You know, for someone like him who's established, been doing this for a while, got a big team, coming into it multi channel yeah. from the beginning is the is, is ideal, I think, for mo a lot of people. Yeah. But for someone that maybe is watching this that's just getting going or they're doing a few hundred thousand dollars on Amazon, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that teach out there. You got to diversify. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. And mm -hmm. I disagree with that in the beginning if you're new. If you're brand new, uh, yeah. I think you actually need to focus on one channel, whether that's Shopify or whether that's Amazon or whatever your 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 mm -hmm. pill of choice is. Um, just focus on that and try to master that as much as you can. Get that going, take advantage of it, and then expand out. And Amazon yeah. is one of the best places and not the best place mm -hmm. because the eyeballs are already there. Yeah. Uh, it, it takes the less, least – I mean, there's a lot of moving parts to Amazon, but um, – it, it can be a little bit easier to get going there than versus trying to set up your own Shopify site and driving traffic and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so um, that's where I think you should start and then worry about diversifying off uh, once you get that going. Yeah, uh, and, no, and totally agree. I just, I'm just trying to think of, you know, that with, if people are, they're, say their money's tied up in inventory, right? Their Amazon business going along, but they're kind of treading water because they've got no existing, additional revenue there. They're going to then have to use their skill sets and sell their time, I suppose, on the side. Does that make sense? You know, the make biggest up, thing, yeah, yeah, the biggest thing you can do if, if that's the case hmm. is as an Amazon seller, it's a very unique skill set. You yeah. know, when I when I bring on uh, partners, uh, you know, like in one of my one of my businesses, I have uh, I have partners. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them is a you know their their specialty is sourcing, uh, and another one's specialty is finance, is, is money. You know, putting in the money, and then my specialty is I know the e commerce and Amazon. And what they said to me, I have the highest percentage in this company uh, as mm -hmm. far as you know the breakdown and the reason. I have almost twice what they have. And they, they say, it's like, look, it's easier to go find another sourcing agent or sourcing person. It's easier to go, if you've got a good idea, to go find somebody else to give you the money. But it's very, very difficult to find someone that knows this Amazon e-commerce business. Yeah. Uh, and so if you're a seller out there that's already doing well, you have a unique skill set. You know how you've already been wearing a lot of hats. You know how sourcing, you know about money, you know about uh, marketing, you know about something about a lot of things. And so you could leverage that. There's a lot of people that are either not on Amazon or that are on Amazon that are completely screwing it up hmm. and starting some sort of little agency or, or taking on other people's accounts for a, a five or ten percent commission hmm. uh, can can be a, a, and you could be a lifesaver for them and they, they'll, they'll pay you. And that's you're basically selling your knowledge or your air. Hmm. I mean, you don't need to go out and start a course or anything like that. There's plenty of people hmm. doing that already. Yeah. Uh, and most people that do that 
you know, they spend a lot of time developing something and sell five, five courses uh, and that's it. Um, so, or a software, a software company, uh, you know, so I see people getting into that too. And most of those people have like 10 subscribers. Yeah. Um, so I think you, the best thing for an Amazon seller from is to leverage that knowledge base you have and help other people, other big companies uh, yeah. and they're dying for it. They can't find it. Yeah, yeah. So what over like macro is to go to these larger companies that use Amazon as a channel, but their team are, are not very knowledgeable about it, and go in and consult for them and do some of the he heavy lifting on that channel being Amazon. Yeah, it doesn't even have to be a heavy a big hitter. It might be the mm. local. I mean, I mean, take advantage of the situation right now. Look at all across mm. America and the world, stores are closed. A little mom and pop store that yeah. maybe it's some lady uh, that's uh, she's she's really good at making candles and soap. I, I'm just yeah. making this up, you know. She's, yeah, yeah, yeah. She's got a candle and soap soap store that's uh, down the corner, and then you know she normally sells a thousand dollars a day through there and th tickle pink. Mm. Well, and she's got all this inventory sitting there. Maybe you go to her and you say, look, you know, I know how to put this stuff on Amazon. I'm not yeah. saying you should do candles and soap. I mean, that may be something else, but just for example, and yeah. you're like, look, let me do your Amazon listing and uh, I won't, just give me a cut. You know, yeah. what do we do? I'll take 10, 20% and they'll probably be tickle pink. It's a win-win for both of you. Yeah. So just to break down, I, like that model that you're talking about, the agency model, the way it works, normally it's about $3,000 a month management and then it's a percentage of revenue. So it's anywhere between one and 5%. And when you hit to hundred grand, it's, sl it, it's a sliding scale down. Now, the other model that you're talking about was percentage only. The danger of that is that you can literally spend six months to a year building someone's Amazon business, but suddenly when it, the invoice comes in at 10 grand a month, they, they start to get a little bit wavy with that. It gets yeah. bit, you know, So it's, it's, it can be kind of difficult. So a, a model like that, if you want to go out and manage accounts, the hybrid model probably works best. You may not get $3,000 a month plus the percentage now, but you might get half of that and a higher percentage on a sliding scale. So that's another way of looking at it. But managing accounts, I don't, we don't do that. We only do PPC strictly. It can be labor intensive, but it doesn't matter if you only need some money on the side and you've got, I don't know, two accounts you're looking after and you get three, three to six grand in a month. That's not a bad living for someone in the middle of a downturn if you're a bit sh strapped for cash. Yeah, that's, I, I think that's a really good point. And just uh, eBay, for example, came out with a, kind of a, this idea of the, the Main Street Bridge, right? eBay's mm -hmm. going, hey, you guys can list free stuff online. So all these retail stores who are closed, you can put your stuff online for free on eBay. Mm -hmm. And this is this is a great thing. It is a great idea. Certainly nice PR. The reality is 95% or 98% of those stores would have done it already if they knew what they were doing. So this mm -hmm. skill set, whether it's eBay or Amazon, is uh, valuable. Uh, Amazon's adding a little extra headache to us by saying, mm -hmm. um, A, you can't ship in inventory in certain categories. So that's mm -hmm. not great for Amazon sellers. And B, even prime two-day delivery often now takes 30 days. Yeah. So that that's another uh, uh, possibility. So we we have to deal with those realities. And I agree with Kevin. Amazon is by far the best place to to get your get your feet wet. But when you're literally out of business because Amazon can't keep up, and that's fair on their part. Just to be clear, mm -hmm. there's only so many doctors. There's only so much cubic space. So many humans. Yeah. Uh, but that, I think whether it's eBay or Walmart, any other channel, helping people is a great idea, and they need the help. They're desperate mm -hmm. for the help. Yeah. No, agreed. And like you said, you know, you might not like to do phone bashing, but it's probably a good time is to to look out, uh, look onto Amazon, decide what products you want to sell, then look at these stores and start phoning around because the mindset's probably changed. You know, if you've done it last year, you won't get a returned call. But it's a different time now, isn't it? And like with what's going on with China and what's going on in the US or the UK, the mindset's going to be a lot different now. If they can't sell out the front of their store, they're going to be open to new ideas of selling online. So um steve should we move this on to things like i don't sell on shopify or sell, sell personally off amazon but you do should we talk a little bit about that as well is uh you know if you're in a situation you're doing well on amazon at the moment but you're not looking to invest in new products but you're looking to go wide in terms of your distribution what are some of the things they should do and then we'll come to kian as well well uh, you know the first thing is uh, I like to have uh, alternative channels like Shopify or Magento or WooCommerce or whatever it is. There, there's yeah. different reasons. I know that we get stuck in the echo chamber and everybody's like, uh, I heard Shopify repeated 86 times, so that must be the only game in town. Mm -hmm. But believe me, there's there's options, there's alternatives, and it depends on what your business goals, objectives, your own strengths are. 
but let's assume that people are on Shopify and I have some Shopify stores. Learn how to promote those stores, learn how to drive revenue in. Hmm. It ain't as easy as Amazon, but no. actually if you start doing the economics, if you pay 20% uh, in ad costs to acquire a customer on Shopify, you're about the same as many of the Amazon uh, commissions. Um, and by the way, having a third party logistics center is one of the key pieces to making that work in my opinion, hmm. particularly right now when Amazon is struggling with their, their own uh, FBA hmm. center. So I really like to have that. You know, this week we have you know seen on certain categories, we've seen it just explode. And the, that, that reality that people will search and shop and buy elsewhere is upon us and, and those behaviors will change. So I say at least get a, another site if you only have one product, hmm. it's really hard to make that work. Yeah, there's it's no variation, really hard. is there? Yeah, it, it, just, and, it, be, it doesn't seem credible to a lot of people. And I, and I definitely say because of acquisition costs as well. If you've got consumable products, thirty dollars and above, there's a much better chance for you than a product that you know a me too. It sells at twelve ninety nine to make the numbers work. You know? Impossible. Yeah. The, yeah. The, anything, anything that is going to be less than $30 in contribution from a customer is mm. going to be really hard to make uh, uh, money on. The cost per acquisition, if you guys don't know that math, please okay. start to understand it. Yeah, it's a yeah. really important one. If, if you only have a single product, the only way to really that you, like like to Steve's point, you really need a, a range of products. But if you are one of those that has a single product or maybe two, uh, the, the better way is not a Shopify, it's to actually put it through a funnel, you know, either using mm -hmm. click funnels or Sam cart or one of those. Yeah. And to, to the point of you need to know your acquisition cost, uh, the, the way to do that is to upsell. Mm -hmm. And so, so that's maybe your product is a 1299 product and you just, the math doesn't. We lost you there, Kevin, but Abigail was saying, what about a funnel if you have a single product that we're just discussing? Yeah, sorry, gone. She's right. Kevin's right too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. By the way, I think Empowery has the has a Kartra as as kind of a preferred resource over ClickFunnels because it's got yeah. more stuff yeah. built into it. It's kind of yeah. like three times the value. Uh, yeah. And I also share, shared Empowery.com slash ROI. People can go check their their math on you know how many impressions, how many clicks, how much they're paying, what's yeah. the cost to acquire that customer, and there's even a little recurring revenue you can check your lifetime value again. So no yeah. math, please. please. Uh, do you know what as well? Was one, one good skill that you can learn is if you're able to drive a traffic to a landing page. People don't understand the science behind the build of a landing page, where an image sits, the eye line, how it goes up and down, how people scan bullet points. If you can learn the anatomy of a landing page and be really focused, just like what Kevin said there, you've got one product. The last thing you're going to want is links across the top to distract. You want one entrance in. And then you have one call to action. And then if you can work out with your Google Analytics, how you're working out with whatever traffic source that you're using, extrapolating that da uh, data, and then you build in like a, a cross promo there and work out your customer acquisition costs based on if it's also a consumable product as well. All of those elements is going to make it a lot easier. And if you can do that with one product and understand the science behind it all, then you can expand it across the rest of the site and you can scale that. Yeah, I should say this, and I'd love to Kean's opinion on this, but we had a brand uh, that I bought. It's kind of a liquidation thing. Uh, hmm. We couldn't send any more stuff into Amazon, even though it was a very critical category. It's a standing desk, right? So those have been blowing up during this situation, but it was not. they were not accepting it algorithmically. And so... We were kind of dead in the water, and our largest customer for that product is the home goods brand, uh, Retail Stores, uh, is a division of T TJ Maxx, which they closed all their stores, and they're online, by the way. Uh, yeah. They're online. So yeah. it's a really weird thing. So we have you know thousands of these desks sitting around, so we made a funnel, one-page yeah. funnel. We're advertising. We know our cost per acquisition. We have the contribution margin and the, the revenue, mm -hmm. and it works, and it works really, really well. So uh, I don't know if Kian's had experience with that, but it certainly works for us. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think uh, when dealing in this sort of situation and looking at other different channels, you have to really analyze and understand uh, for yourself and your own business, what is your propensity to risk and what is your cash flow available? Mm -hmm. Because there are a lot of different channels that you can take. You know, I, I'm more, I'm a lot more experienced in the whole like retail and licensing model, which has taken a hit as well. Obviously, the, the retail model of the stores being closed, but licensing is still very, very effective as long as those products are still being sold online. But then it's also what is affected by our current situation as well, because like we were the number one bestseller on NBA.com 
uh, in homeware for the NBA face pillows that we were doing, but the NBA season's been shut down for a month. So like, obviously the license, but maybe like a, a Nickelodeon or a Disney license might go down really well because p kids are at home watching Disney movies and stuff like that. So you can sort of adopt the strategy of, okay, what licenses do I want to go after? What licenses add value to my brand and, and what sort of market can I benefit from? Because remember, like when you get a certain license, you're also getting that demographic, which now likes your product because the license that they like, that logo is now on your product. So you can capture a whole different market uh, through a license. Um, and then with the retailers as well, you know, you could try and gear yourself up to get into a retailer for when this thing goes back to normal. But the, the challenging thing is that like retail, because we've been closed for a while, they've had a stock pile up. And normally retailers like to order their products like one year in advance. So when we're uh, supplying a lot of retailers in the UK, they would give us their order, the forecast order for the year. Uh, and typical retailers who don't commit to the stocks. So I'm sure a lot of people are in trouble right now, but um, you, we would just have to drip it in. But they're, they've probably got a massive pile up because all those products have already been produced. Um, but then I think like if you're going to go down the Shopify route or uh, another store online, is for me there's like three main pillars it's content traffic conversion it's as simple as that right and your content has to be a1 you have to be putting out the best content with best videographers best photos if you want to stand a chance because now more than ever brand is the most important uh then traffic how you sending traffic there whatever knows about like, and the Google type and of traffic as well it's the quality it, it, of the traffic you know it, yeah. it, exactly but now i think there's a massive opportunity uh, to pick up influencers on the cheap because bear in mind the in influencers send a lot of traffic but now their revenue is really dried up because like now they're not as in demand anymore so for example like a lot of travel influencers i was speaking to them a lot some of them are very big followers like one million followers they can't send traffic to travel bags anymore uh, right. so they're just sitting there with this warm engaged audience so now like leverage that to get yourself a much better deal with influencers which have been more effective to send uh, traffic to your store um, and then the conversion as well, just as you guys were talking about, make sure your page is actually optimized and use this time to learn a new skill. If you don't know about like landing page conversions, optimization, all that, just take, an, uh, take a day, take a week, just master it. You've got the time now. So, so just go for it. Yeah. And let me just jump in, Danny, and just say this, that I recommend progress, not perfection, right? Yeah. So you have to, you're, you're going to have to optimize. You're going to have to get good, but do something not nothing. And, and mm. Kim made a really good point about pivoting, right? The, the fact that, you know, certain categories, maybe the MBA is down, but maybe, you know, something else is up. We, we had a, an exact example of this, um, mm. but for, I, I have some health conditions. Uh, and so I, I couldn't find masks. And so I'm like, I gotta find me some masks. And so finally I found a dental supply company that had masks and they said, yeah, it really sucks for us because no dentists are open. We're going to go out of business. And I said, uh, well, that sucks. Uh, I'll buy the company. How many masks you got? <laughs> and, so, uh, and then I shopped for another dental supply company. So uh, so the, the dentists who are all idle and, and not able to do stuff, other people need this stuff. So finding a way to solve a problem uniquely hmm. is, is uh, an important thing. And there's a lot of variations of that. Uh, grocery stores, for example, are now packaging food from local restaurants in kind of the ready-made containers so that they can keep those restaurants busy. Uh, yep. Guys who make pillows, guys who make fashion, now they're making masks. Uh, there, there's lots of examples of these guys pivoting. Everybody's pivoting mm -hmm. uh, to, to try to help and, and, and just figure out how to make money and keep the, keep the world turning. Yeah, and going back to this whole thing, testing, if you, like a lot of people got time on their hands and they can learn this, so you don't need a lot of money. I'll give you an example, in 2010, I um I built a uh, a startup that no one want, wanted. Spent fourteen months in stealth production. Built a whole team. Never tested it with anyone, and it was a fucking complete disaster. Excuse my name. It was a complete <laughs> disaster. And then after that, every business I built started with a landing page with some copy and Google ads. And I thought if I test that and prove that, and I start getting some phone calls, and I can learn from that, I've got a business. If not, it don't matter. So I probably went for about eight to nine different businesses until I landed two or three of those. They were service-based businesses. But it isn't that difficult. you just got to remove all the other filters away and just focus on what's important. Now, I'll tell you now, Facebook ads and Google ads are a lot more progressive now than using Amazon ads. As you can see, it's like Fisher Price in comparison. But, you know, if you spend 40 to 60 hours, which we've got time of now, you can develop quite high-level skills there learn about landing pages there's places out there like uh, there's a uh, conversion excel was a fantastic 
blog. The uh, the, the the conversion expert there is uh, Pep Larger. He's the godfather of conversion optimization. This is way before Russell Brunson and everyone else. Go and read some of that stuff there. It's incredible um, what you can learn. And literally, if you've got an internet connection, there are ways to make money, but you just have to spend maybe on each project, allow $300 or £400 or wherever currency that you're in to do this and just go through and test and test and test. I mean, to your point, what you could do even on that, uh, Danny, is go learn uh, how to do Facebook or how to set up a Shopify store or affiliate marketing. Yeah. And if you don't have inventory, set you up a store with not one product, but 50 different products all around uh, PPE or whatever mm -hmm. it is, and yeah. then all affiliate links go into Amazon or go into wherever and use other people's money um, yeah. and, and, and learn. And you're going to see patterns. You're going to see things. Throw some random product out there. Maybe you're thinking about selling this or something and yeah. see if anybody bites and see, see what happens. You can, there's a lot you can do if you get creative and pivot. Hmm. Steve, do you want to add anything here? Uh, no, I think all of those are, are very fair points. It, the, the reality is if you have something that people want, you've got to figure out how to get in front of them. By the way, Amazon Prime shoppers are aware that they can't get everything they, they used to get. Uh, mm -hmm. I was talking to the, the buyers at Costco the other day. We were trying to you know uh, come in and, and solve some problems, and they're like, listen, we're not talking to anybody. It doesn't matter if you have an account or not. We're not talking to anybody unless you are selling, you know, like the food and the, th you know, just the yeah. very front end thing. So the world is crazy. It's upside down. But the more you think about how to solve the problem uniquely, I like Kevin's idea. Spin mm. up a site. I like your idea. A, a quick site, throw some traffic at it, learn, get better, smarter, yeah. faster. Well, especially Don't if wait. you can, yeah, if you can learn from phone calls, that's an amazing way to learn. You know, we always have this discussion. Everyone will tell you the same thing to do. Go out and find your customers, go to a coffee shop and speak to them. How many people do that? No one. But you'll tell them, I will say to people, go and find and know your customer, but I won't take my own advice to do that. That's the greatest way to learn or an inbound inquiry. So if you do build a site, you're going to learn more from not someone hitting the page and buying something. You're going to learn more if they have to phone you and ask questions because you can really pepper them to get the answers you're looking for as well. Yeah, I mean, that's a really good point, Danny. Oh, sorry. And yeah. I, I was just going to say, like, you know, a lot of people are looking at opportunities in like different categories, different sectors, different uh, channels and whatnot. But another opportunity is just looking inward in your business, dealing with your existing customers and see how you can now over deliver for the customers which have already bought from you. Because like we always say, you know, you're at the mercy of Amazon and they control your list. But anyone who's built a community and has developed a brand and has access to their own customer base will start phoning those guys, start reaching out to those guys and see how you can better deliver for those guys and turn those people into brand evangelists and more loyal customers and then get more sales out of the people that you already have in your ecosystem rather than going out to try and find new people. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, there's a, can I get to some of the questions in the feed? Sorry, Kevin, you go first. And, and, I've got the questions. No, even if you like what, what Keon says, if you have a customer list, so many people are always worried about, I got to get the next customer, I got to get the next customer. I see, I, I'm a, I, people don't leverage the data that the, your customer list is your, one of your most valuable assets. Mm -hmm. And I, so many businesses don't actually maximize that at all. They're always worried about the next customer versus going within. So maybe, if you, back to your point to tie this all together is if you don't have a lot of money right now or t money is tight, but you got a list of us, say a hundred thousand customers on your email list, maybe why don't you go back and to tie that to Kian's point is help them out. Say, Hey, look, we're going to, tr I found a mask factory or a whatever factory. We're going to put it in order, but I want to help our customers. We're just going to pass along at cost or we're going to market up a, a small amount. If you're interested in joining, let them finance the whole order. Uh, and then you help not only are you maybe making a little money to put a few thousand bucks in your pocket to pay your bills, uh, <clears throat> but you're also helping them and they're going to reward you and that can extend your brand. There's so many things you can do uh, if you just get creative about it. Yep, indeed. Um, so Owen Burroughs says, which to develop your first, your own e-commerce website or a Shopify site? To me, those are the same thing. I have to so say. That's what I, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's just a choice. You know, you might Shopify be is just a, a platform. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Exactly. Um, what have we got here? This is the big question. So I'm going to cover everyone's faces for one second while we read it out. So hello, masters. Kevin says, thank you. I'm working on the representation <laughs> deal of a brand from Europe that is already sells on Amazon EU. I would be the re responsible to import and launch their products in Amazon USA. They don't sell in the USA. I have two questions. How can I import the reviews of Amazon Europe to Amazon USA? I don't think it works. I think it's the other way. It goes US back to EU and it's based on the same ASINs. 
And how can I get brand registry in the USA? I'm only, I am signing an exclusivity contract. Obviously, I'm not the owner of the brand, but need to find a way to gate their products. So, so yeah, yeah, you're not going to be able to – brand registry is not gating. Uh, exactly. let, me, let me let me clarify that. And as far as the the first question there about the the reviews, it, there is an option on Amazon in the U.S. that it, it like Danny said it it goes the other way automatically. But there's an option that says show international reviews or show reviews from other marketplaces in the U.S. So before you get some reviews in the U.S., there will be something that shows down there in most most cases if it's listed on multiple marketplaces where they can see those. Um, and then as far as the the brand registry, you're not the owner of the brand. But if that brand, uh, you can register them. They're going to have to behalf, yeah. on their behalf in the U.S. If they and if they already have a trademark somewhere in Europe, you can use that. You don't need to go through the process in America. I mean, from a legal point of view, they should go through the process in America because that's what's going to help you legally in a court law if there's an issue. But from an Amazon point of view, it's not necessary to get brand registry. So you can use their trademark. They're going to have to uh, respond to a couple emails that Amazon is going to send on your behalf and then give you permission. Uh, into uh, uh, as your email or whatever you're logging in to do that, and it's easily done. I've done that in the past. Cool. Uh, let's see if there's any more questions here before we move in. Oh, here we go. Owen, I was wrong. Uh, happy to admit I'm wrong. Owen says, Danny, my reviews went from UK to US. That's good. I think that's more uh, based on the English language bit. Uh, the, the international ones, I, I think, are more like Kevin said, you have to kind of opt into it. Uh, right. But I don't, yeah. I'm not positive. They change this stuff regularly, by the way, everybody. We could be right today and wrong tomorrow and then right again the next day. Exactly. So what about um, investments, Steve? Do you, if you, I don't know if you talk publicly about it, but do you have if investments outside of general commerce? I know we're not talking about multi-channel selling. We're talking about property or is there anything you invest in outside of this? Yeah, I, I'm, you know, I have some equities, I have some uh, real estate and things like that. Yeah. Uh, I'm not as uh, obsessed with it as some of my uh, friends and counterparts. I mean, they, they're just absolutely enthralled with that. Uh, I, I, I do it because, you know, I, I need to have some, uh, uh, I don't know, differentiation, but hmm. no question, every time I start a company, not every time, but most of the time I can put money in a company and I will do better than any stock market, any real estate. Yeah. Uh, so that's kind of my strength that I lean into that strength. Occasionally we have a hit, occasionally we have a miss, but uh, that's that's where I focus. And, and for me, I never try to outsmart the market, right? Everybody was telling me, you know, whatever it was two and a half years ago, they're like, sell your house, Bitcoin's blowing up. Uh, you know, sell your house. Literally a guy on stage uh, at a show, I won't, won't call out oh, the no. show, and yeah. he's like, you know, and we're back in the VIP area. Kevin was there, I'm sure. Uh, and he's like, you better sell your house. This is Bitcoin's uh, like 18 grand or uh, 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 whatever. Um, and he's like, sell everything, le leverage debt, blah, blah, blah. And uh, and we're, I'm just like, this is the most insane thing ever. I didn't understand Bitcoin then. I don't understand it now. Hmm. Uh, but we know what ha has happened. So my my point is, don't chase the, the thing. Don't try to be more clever than the world, right? Hmm. I, I have all these people come and tell me, Oh, I can I can guarantee twenty percent by this or that, and it's like all of that smells weird to me, and I, I'm just not a fan. So I, yeah. I stay with uh, you know pretty traditional, pretty easygoing things when I get outside of my my own uh, expertise. No, that makes total sense, uh, Kevin. Do you have any other investments? I know. Do you talk publicly about that? company that's really good at christmas i can't remember if you talk publicly yeah, so don't want... yeah that's e-commerce still though uh, yes yeah yeah, yeah. That, yeah that's an e-commerce company as well um but yeah most of my stuff is all in the e-commerce field i don't have any real estate that's something yeah. i would like to do at some point uh to, but not sink multifamily homes uh where you have a uh, that's something like that at some point uh but i'm not there right now i'm reinvesting everything in e-commerce for the same reason steve said yeah. the return the returns are better uh, yeah. and I, to me, I don't understand real estate. And so I understand e-commerce. So to me, I, why not do what I understand where I think I have a better chance? Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, I've got some other securities and things like that. Uh, but no, I'm, I, I double down almost exclusively in e-commerce. Well, what about new partnerships in, let's just say people are a little bit tight for money, but they do joint ventures. They're, they're both parties at Excel, or Amazon. Uh, one may be good at PPC. One's good at branding and sourcing. Let's talk about some options of deals that could be put together there for the audience. 
Yeah. Boy, that's really smart. Really smart, actually. Yeah, I, like, I think like, like, like product savants. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. We sl slid in a little. Uh, I that one, didn't uh, I yeah. 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 Can you so that? yeah. Go on. What kind of character is this? Uh, <laughs> so one of, one of the things that I think is, is clever is there are plenty of people who have capital to put to work. And there's plenty of people who have talent to put to work. And mm. often when you put those people together, uh, good things can happen. There's deals happening right now. We have guys who, you know, they're, they're scared of the equity market or maybe they want to uh, de-risk an equity market, but they want to figure out how they can get into e-commerce. Like Kian talked about earlier, their retail is struggling or their 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 primary channel, even if they think it's going to come back immediately, they're like, I don't want to be like this again, right? So I have I have uh, friends and colleagues and, and partners even that they're so into their own category at one, one industry, they're probably lose 20 to 30% of the retailers. So they're moving very rapidly to say, how do we open up our own online and direct channels? And so those people you know, there could be equity deals, there could be partnership deals, there could be all kinds of things. And I want everybody to just think creatively and, and uh, you know, it doesn't hurt to have conversations about, you know, partnerships and, and who's putting in what. I will just say, no matter what you do when it comes to that, define uh, the accountabilities and the responsibilities for each partner, define early and often the transparency about, you know, uh, percentages your expectations yeah. about selling, all that stuff. Because during the honeymoon, everybody's happy. And, you know, a year from then, it's like, well, I didn't think that. And now now you got a problem and it, the, it can get ugly. Agreed. I think that I've got a, a model that I've got uh, partners with is that there's two things. The biggest challenge is when you both got Amazon accounts, both parties. One, you decide where the brand goes and what account gets sent to uh, and who puts the money up and what the percentage is. So what we do is we have a 70 30. So if it comes through my account, then I'll put up the money, but the split is 70 30. But equally, we'll do a brand through their account and do the same thing. And we use, I won't name the software, but we use, you know, uh, uh, software that, that, that does all your PL, et cetera. And one of the easy things that you can do at any time is you just run a report. So you're going to run through all of your expenses and et cetera, because it's all been put into your into your system and then all you've got to do is separate a column and divide by two then you know where you are in terms of if it's 50 50 or 70 30 and we found that's one of the easiest ways because the toughest one like you said Steve, is finding out how do you do the reporting like really quickly and obviously using third-party software helps with that and just downloading the report and just you know as i said two columns that kind of settles it to tell you where you are to a point one of the things too, like Steve mentioned that, you know, the honeymoon period, everything's hanky dory. And then a year or two later, things go sour. You get sick of each other. He's got a unique, uh, maybe Steve can talk about with the shotgun. Uh, uh, what was it called? The shotgun uh, or a clause that you put in the agreement. Hmm. Basically, if uh, one, one, I'll let Steve explain it. He can explain it better than me, but it's a, a pretty unique thing that I think is a, a good idea for anybody going into a partnership to actually do. Yeah, cool. Yes, you've heard of Santa Claus. This is the shotgun clause, his brother, who's the enforcer of all contracts. <laughs> no. a, a shotgun clause, the principle is, as you go into the deal during the honeymoon period, you, you basically say, hey, if if we're unhappy or this thing ain't working, either of us can initiate a buyout and, mm. and essentially say, hey, I will pay you $50,000 to leave uh, right now and mm. I'll just take over the deal. But the shotgun part of that is they can just say no, I'll pay you the 50,000 now that you've initiated this clause and now you're out. So mm -hmm. that, that forces the party to bring an offer that is, is that they would themselves accept. Mm -hmm. And this, this is a, a quick way to just kind of settle every, all, all the potential disputes. It's like, Hey, if things go wrong, you want a divorce, this is the quickest way to do it because somebody who really wants out will put in whatever number they themselves would accept problem solved. Yeah. And um, I just want to add as well, like super joint ventures. I don't know if a lot of people know like how I got started in the NBA business, but I just sent a direct message on Instagram to a former player. And um, that's, that's someone I knew from university briefly, but I just said, look, you you played in the league, you know the players, you know that you have all the connections in the league. I know manufacturing, I know retailers, I know sourcing. Let's put these two powers together and we can develop a cool brand. And that was all it was, just a message on Instagram. And that's how we started. Um, and then that led to so many other things. So I think use this time wisely as well as it, like, you know, look at people within your own network, but then just look at people on social media as well that you think like, okay, my skill set aligns with their skill set, send a message and you never, you never know where it could lead you. Hmm. 
slightly off slightly off topic uh stefano is said amazing people one question maybe sorry steve with, with berry I'll, I'll bring you back in a moment one question maybe off topic now sorry have you ever have you ever bring in your suppliers competitors product to improve yours i see that engine of one of my competitors is better than mine how can i improve this electrical product Kien. Um, I didn't fully understand the question. So, did you ever yes, bring your Yes, because I've, I've just done it in East London accent, didn't I? So, yeah. have, you, have, <laughs> no, no, have you ever? <laughs> have you ever? He says, "Have you ever brought bring?" I think he means brought in. Have you ever brought in your supplier's competitor's product to improve yours? So, your competitor has been sold at the same factory. You've taken a look at it, and you've right. used that to sell on Amazon. But ultimately, you want to improve on that. But it's in electrical category. What would you do to improve it? Right, because I, I wasn't sure as if it, do you buy your competitor samples to analyze them and then make your one better, or do you take your competitors because it was like electrical thing and put part of their product into your product? I think I what sure. he was saying he was he's, he's gone to that factory, he's took that product off the shelf and gone, yeah, right. I'll sell that as well and brand it as my own. But now he wants to know how to improve that product. Yeah, I mean, so I, I go off a concept called like imitate and innovate. Like, yeah. you know, you you look at products and you get ideas and you see stuff that's working in the factories. Now, for obvious reasons, you never want to copy anyone's product, but there's always ways you can improve on it. And that's quite often like the fastest way to develop products as well, because bear in mind that when you take something that a factory has already done, their workers are already used to making that product. They've already gone through the teething process of developing that product. They already know how to cut it, how to stitch it, how to put it all together, right? And now you're just like making one small improvement, maybe like say, okay, now we're gonna add waterproof coating to this, or we're gonna make it this like tougher material. And then it's a very, very small change. So you're sort of benefiting off their economies of scale to make your product better. That's the way I would look at it. And that, that can be done over a wide variety of products. Yeah, one, of the ways me, you, one of the ways oh, you would wanna, okay. sorry, sorry Steve. One of the ways you would uh, want to, uh, maybe you have some ideas for yourself, like, hey, let's make this stronger, change the material, but that may be a great idea. But if you really want to know what the marketplace wants rather than what you think it wants, go take a look on, say, Amazon. Even if the product's not sold on Amazon, go take a look at Amazon and look at the top 10 sellers, by not by dollars, but by units in that particular category and read the reviews. Use a tool like Helium 10's uh, Chrome plugin that'll download all those reviews and analyze them for you and look for patterns in there of people saying, I wish this was all blue in a blue color and there's nobody with blue, or I wish this was uh, stronger. I use it for this purpose. I, you know, there's a hundred people saying I use this to go into the river, uh, but it doesn't, it's not waterproof or whatever it is. And you can find, I mean, it's a, a great laboratory and companies 20 years ago would spend hundreds or millions of dollars for this kind of focus group research that you can get basically for free and a little bit of your time online now. Yeah, and I just, uh, I think I'll jump in and help Stefano here because I think he's saying, have you ever brought to your supplier a competitor's product, essentially to have them knock yours, knock it off? And um, I would just like to introduce the audience to a concept called R&D. If you've heard of R&D, go ahead and put the definition in there. Um, but it's everybody who, everybody thinks they knows what it is. They think it's research and development, but it means rip off and duplicate. Uh, and I, I can just tell you, every company on the planet uses R&D of that nature. We have a process that we call RDI, rip off, duplicate, and innovate, right? Because you actually have to do something better. You have to do something that's unique and differentiated. But I want to know every single thing about my primary competitor's products, every single thing. Yeah. And, you know, at the end of the day, 99% of the Amazon sellers who start are absolutely ripping somebody else's product off. The key is how well do you do it? Uh, and do you, can you differentiate it and improve and incrementally make it better by using those things, uh, as Kevin said, the uh, reviews and other feedback. But I absolutely, um, you know, R&D, baby, that's what you got to do. And it, yeah. it does not mean- and and I do that with my products too. If I'm I'm looking at a product, I did this with like say a mirror set. I had, I was going to do a little cosmetic mirror for one of my brands. Oh, I did do this cosmetic mirror, but I got several ones from my top competitors, and I wanted to modify a little bit. I took those, I think it's seven mirrors, and I went into a bar, and I sat at that bar. You know, it's a bar I regularly go to, and every woman that came in the door, and a couple guys, but mostly every woman that came into the door. I asked them, you know, which one of these would you like? And I got immediate feedback and uh, I made a few adjustments based on that, uh, that things I just so, so never, let, would, let's, never would have thought of. Let me have this right. You stood in the bar, you waited for women to come in, you walked up to them with these mirrors and gone, hi, I'm Kevin. Will you look in these mirrors and tell me what's best? Yeah. Uh, did you, did, exactly. you, get, did exactly. you get any abuse or was it all good? 
Uh, it was all, it was all good. It's, a, it's a local neighborhood bar, you know. It's oh, like okay. a like a Cheers yeah. type of bar that I, I go to regularly. It wasn't probably, just like some, some, weird, some, place, weird old, yeah. some weird old man in there with a briefcase full of mirrors. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hello, miss. Would you like to look at yourself? Yeah. 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 <laughs> There's a lot of complaints that day. But uh, you're, 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 yeah. and he needed. That's the point. And a good point it is. You're a braver yeah. man than me. Okay. So uh, it's coming up towards the top of the hour. Um if there, unless there's any more questions, guys, um, let's see if there's any more come in. Let's have a look. Hi, Steve, put your head up because we're losing you again. Is there any way to avoid paying taxes? No. I'll start again. Is there any way to avoid paying taxes for R&D molds if the product is already manufactured before? What is the best way to not get in trouble? I love how the question comes from Facebook user with no profile picture and no name. <laughs> what, what, what's yeah. the yeah. to avoid Facebook that? user, <laughs> ask the yeah. following, yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know if taxes means just paying the fee for the R and D molds. Uh, is that? Do you are you guys aware of some special tax? I, I'm not putting. No, my I mean, you, in the UK, we have R and D innovation grants where you get eighty percent off if you can prove PAYE and etc. But I think he's just focused that around molds. And but then, what territory is that in in the US? But more than likely, it's going to be in China. I don't know, Kian. I, I, yeah, sorry again. I, I didn't fully get a question. Is it like how do I avoid paying tax for something that I research and develop myself? Because yeah, I, I didn't so know. is there a way to avoid paying little... taxes on R and D molds if the I... product is already manufactured before? I think he's talking about it's not innovation, this replication of the product. So can you get relief off those molds? So I think uh, Radul, you can you can jump in here, but I think it just means can you avoid paying for the molds if somebody's already manufactured it? And um, I, I don't know the the tax bit. Uh, oh, so he, I think he's validating that. So basically. If you don't want to pay for the mold and the factory's already made that mold, there's various conditions where that may or may not be acceptable. If I paid for the mold and I said anybody else can use it, but when they do, they have to start paying for the mold until I get paid back. Hmm. Everybody's got to pay their fair share. There's other times where it's already been costed out by now and the factory doesn't care and it's a commodity anyway, and then nobody really has to pay. But the newer it is, the more unique it is, or certainly if it's an exclusive for somebody, you're going to have to pay either for your own mold or pay to, to use that mold um that that's just the nature of the beast in my opinion yeah I, I think there's a couple of important points here as well like see if whenever a factor is willing to give out a mold as well the factory might be willing to do it because they want the order but whoever owns that mold just make sure they haven't design registered or patented that product in their home market because that's to protect themselves against the factory for basically uh you know letting other people use the mold the other thing i like to do whenever i develop a mold myself to prevent that from happening is that i like to put my company logo in the mold so if anyone ever tries to copy it well you're going to see my logo and then i'm going to know who did it uh so that's the other thing if you are going to use someone else's mold just make sure there's no logos inside there yeah so so smart uh, i do want to say <laughs> that um molds actually don't last forever so yeah, you know, they get cycles, they, don't they? Yeah, yeah. so the, there's some usage number. If you're going to run out half of the its useful life, you should pay for part of that uh, lifespan mm -hmm. uh, just so people understand that it's not an un, unyielding forever thing in all cases. Okay. Yeah, and, 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 I, go on, oh. sorry. Well, I was going to say this, the same thing goes with like fabric patterns as well, right? So we do a lot of work for the military uh, in the UK and we supply the military directly, but then also just the, we call them weekend warriors. So people who like to feel like they're part of the military. And um, what we did is we like basically developed our own camouflage, which was so similar to the one that the British Army used, very similar color, similar pattern. And like someone pulled up, pulled us up about it and said like, hey, you've copied our pattern. I was like, no, we haven't, because what I did was like, I, I designed the pattern myself, but I put in like a little tiny dolphin and this dolphin comes up like once in every one meter square. So I pulled out a fabric and showed the dolphin. I said, your British Army camel doesn't have a dolphin in it. So you can also plant these little things in fabric designs as well to prove that it's Snake yours. Egg. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds Very good. Clever. Uh, Michael says, hey guys, what's the best advice for product research for a newbie at this tough time after the pandemic? <clears throat> After, after the pandemic? Uh, yeah. is what, I mean, right now the product research is a little messed up uh, because things are like, uh, you, you know, luggage is showing that nobody buys luggage and uh, everybody's buying supplements or things are elevated or buying PPE stuff. So you have to be careful using the current product research and things are going in and out of stock. So the tools like market, like uh, Helium 10 or Vire Launch or Jungle Scout, they can give you some misleading data. So you've got to go back and look at the past. I mean, like when I, I'm doing product research now, but I'm looking back at like uh, last summer, uh, you know, before fourth quarter, what was things during a normal month? Uh, 
uh, if it's not a seasonal product, what's things was things like in June of last year, for example, uh, and, and taking a look at that and then seeing it and having to use my own uh, brain to say, is this product going to have a little bit of a rise because of more people are coming to e-commerce or more people are buying now? Is it going to get a little bit of a bump after this is over? So those tools you can all do that with. It's a little bit more complicated, um, but uh, you can go in and, and you got to look at that past and uh, not not really count on what's happening right now as being what's going to happen in the future. Yeah, makes sense. Um, okay, do we have any, no, no more questions, I don't think. So let's uh, wrap here. Give, uh, if we go around, maybe do, Kevin, can you give two options on what people should do now in terms of diversified income, whether that's if you're if you're low on cash or you've got an, a surplus of cash, what would you suggest? Well, if, if you're low on cash right now, it's uh, what, what I was saying is either try to help other people uh, get onto the platform or go out there and create, uh, if, if you're good at the social media or traffic side, uh, create a, some sort of affiliate site where you use other people's products and drive that and, and take a cut of the action. Uh, if you're low on cash, if you, if you got a lot of cash, uh, I would, uh, be maybe doubling down in e-commerce, uh, with that, uh, not so much throwing that into real estate or something else, because who knows what's going to happen with real estate after this, who knows what's going to happen in a lot of industries. But one thing I know for sure is e-commerce is not going down. Um, yeah. and so I would double down in e-commerce. Yeah. extra cash yes yeah, steve is self-isolating in outer space as you can <laughs> see from the behind it's the only um, safe place dan come on it's, let's it's the only place program. exactly um so you steve two two ways either you've well, got cash or you uh, haven't yeah i'll just steal some of the ideas they've said I, I you either have a product to sell or you have time or service to sell uh yeah. at, building on kevin's point sell what you got um the guys who are you know, Uber or Lyft drivers are not getting a lot of business, but they can go do Amazon Flex stuff, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, there's lots of ways to pivot and and to react to this. Um, so that's that's kind of if you're if you don't have capital, you have to sell your time. That's life. Um, if you have capital, look for those opportunities. But we are really looking ahead and saying what categories are going to be, you know, coming back eventually, right? There's going to be some pent up demand, mm -hmm. and what will also suffer a big um, you know, fall back and look for any new trends that may, may be uh, happening as a result of this behavior change. And I quite agree with Kevin. You know, I, I can't predict the future. I don't know how long this virus stuff lasts. The lockdowns could go away instantly. They could last for a lot longer, but something's going to change. Behavior is going to change. Do your best, make your best bets and be in a position to win. We are leaning in to yeah. uh, several categories and trying to take advantage. And, and the final thought, I'll, I'll leave this one for Kim, but he's totally right about influencers like in luggage. They're desperate for other clients. Go get them, make it, make it work. It really is, you know, buy low, sell high. Hey, there's an idea. Write that one down, everybody. <laughs> Excellent. Ken? Yeah. Yeah. And I would say like, regardless of like whatever your income level level is, I would just say, um, discipline yourself to get 1% better every single day in a time like this. I would say like improve the leader, improve the business. Like a lot of people sort of look for the business hacks and say, okay, what's the best way to get organic traffic and what's this, what's that? And you just look for hacks. But I'm like, now is the time to improve. What skill set do you want to develop? What do you want to get better at? And now devote one hour, two hours to that every single day because there's no excuses right now. And you can really come out of this with a new skill that you never had before. That's what I'd be focusing on. I've, I've basically like, in this time, Danny and I were talking about it off air before, like I'm waking up at 4.30 every morning. I've never done that before in my life. And I just said to Danny, I've had the most productive week I've ever had in my life. And uh, you just really get disciplined, uh, focus on something, have an objective and come out of this a better person. Indeed. Um, okay, so look, let's wrap that there. This episode is going to be a replay. It will appear on 179, Steve, is that right? On awesomers.com? Correct. Awesomers.com yep. slash 179. So, so you'll get the replay there and it will also appear on seller sessions through the usual channels. Gentlemen, thank you for coming in today. Kian, what's the best way that everyone can reach you? So I'm actually doing something really cool tonight. Um, so I'm, I'm very, very active on Instagram, right? And my Instagram is just Kian underscore JG. Tonight, for the very first time, I'm doing an Instagram Live, which I've never done before. But what I did is I'm bringing in three very special guests. Uh, first guy, a guy called Alex Quinn, 
good friend of mine in the States and he's basically a Forbes accredited marketer. He does marketing for Nike, Adidas, all that. We're gonna have a 20 minute conversation. Uh, after that, I've got my friend Jake Haveron, who is a, a motivational speaker and does a lot of fitness and nutrition for Tony Robbins' guys and Fortune 500 CEOs. He's gonna be talking about how to stay fit. And then I've got a guy called Jeff Seconder who's gonna teach everyone how to get to get 0% credit. And I'm gonna do that one hour tonight from seven till 8 p.m. UK time on Instagram. So if you check it out, it's gonna be a lot of fun. So hopefully see you there. Excellent. Uh, and you, Kevin? Uh, yeah, the best way is probably uh, on Facebook, AMZ Marketer, or uh, yeah, yeah, that's probably the best way to actually get a hold of me. Or uh, you know, be sure to check out ProductSavants.com. Uh, it's the thing that Steve and I do together. Or if you're uh, selling for uh, selling quite a bit uh, already in the e-commerce or Amazon space, uh, BillionDollarSellerSummit.com. Excellent. And for you, Steve. Yeah, easiest thing, awesomers.com slash podcast. And, uh, you know, you'll you'll see what I'm up to and stay in touch. Great. So, gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Guys, you know where to find me. I'll be back here 4 p.m. UK time as ever tomorrow and the next day. Whilst we're on lockdown, we've been doing seven days a week. It's not going to stop. We're here to support you. Stay home. Be healthy. Much love. And I'll see you all again soon. Take care. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Thanks. everybody.